you make the point about salvation, right? And you say, you know, we can, you know, we we can desire in religion teachings and correct me if I'm misstating this, but teachings that incline us towards the salvation of the world, the salvation defined as the continuing material progress in a, in, of, of civilization, the sustainability of our global village, um, and, and so forth. Um, and com coming, to that as, coming to that as a Catholic and imagining somebody coming to that as a Jew or as a Muslim or as a Mormon or you know, pick, pick, pick a significant religious tradition in the West, um, and by the way, I did not mean to start an argument about whether Mormons are Christians <laughs> um, <laughs> with, that, with, that, with that lineup. But you, you had that argument on Blogging Heads TV, yeah, and no, I enjoyed that, yeah, by the way. Well, this is Blogging Heads TV. Check it out. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it seems like there is, you know, in a, in a sense, the argument in your book is that, hey, as you said, hey, Jews, hey, Christians, hey, Muslims, the, you know, deep religious found what you think of as the deep religious foundations of your faith are not, in fact, true. Um, you know, Jesus was not, in fact, the Son of God, not, in fact, the second person of the Trinity, and so forth. Muhammad, probably not the seal of the prophets, and so forth. The Bible, not, in fact, written by Moses under dictation from God, and so forth. But it does seem as though the salvation that you are, that you're talking about and that you think religion should be inclined towards is a much more limited form of salvation than the kind of salvation certainly well, and this and this gets I know and this gets into east versus western religion mm -hmm. issues and what you know what buddhism talks about versus what the west talks about but to, you know to take the particular example of christianity right you know part of the message of christianity is universal love Right, and that you know, and and whether it came from Christ Himself or from the Apostle Paul, that's an incredibly potent part. Clearly, Christians and non-Christians can agree of Christianity's appeal. But you know, part of the message of Christianity is that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. Um, and I think it's probable that that's a more important part of the success of the Christian story than just the universal love part. That certainly that's the part that, that's the push that gets it moving. And it seems to me that you, I'm not sure what you say to the religious believer who looks, who looks at your argument and says, well, you're saying that if there is a God, he wants us to be prosperous and nice to each other, but, you know, he doesn't really care about, or we, can, we have no way of knowing whether he cares about the real problems that persist even in a world of continuing material progress like, you know, your wife dying or something, like your child dying. Um, and, and, so, and so it seems like that, I mean, that's one of the places, I think, where historically liberal theology has, of, and I think it's fair to call your theology, to the extent this is theology, a liberal theology, has hit a kind of wall where it's not doing the things that, you know, whatever shamanistic religion was doing, it's clear what religions that emerge in the Judeo-Christian tradition are doing, and they're they're doing they're talking about they're talking about eternity, they're talking about suffering, and they're talking about specific. I mean, you know, Judaism has a law, Christianity has the person of Christ, Islam has a book. You know, they're they're talking about very specific things that relate to very specific issues in human life, and. I'm sort of rambling without coming to a point, but I guess I get, well. I guess the point would be right. So you know, C.S. Lewis has this has this moment in um, the Silver Chair, right? One of the Chronicles of Narnia, where the the people the people have ended up uh, the, the heroes have ended up in this underground world, and the queen of this underground world is telling them they've always been here. You know, there's no sun, there's no moon. These are just projections that they've created from human psychology and mm -hmm. so forth. And mm -hmm. the character in the Silver Chair, Puddle Glum the Marsh Wiggle, who some of you may be familiar with from from your childhoods, you know says in an effort to break the spell, you know, well, the, that's, you know, that's fine. It's certainly possible that what you're saying is true. But, you know, if this is the truth, it's a really, really shabby, shabby truth. And, you know, if what we're saying is true, it's a really remarkable and important truth that, you know, says something much more important to our lives. And so we're going to go out and spend our lives looking for the sun and the moon and the outside world, and maybe we're not going to find it, but it's better than sitting here with you in the dark, even if the dark, you know, you have good food to eat and stuff. So I guess my question is, what, you know, what, th that seems to be the wall that liberal theology has to break through, any sort of purely abstract conception of the divine, right? If you're going to persuade somebody, you have to break through that wall. And is it possible to break through that wall? I mean, doesn't, doesn't abstraction ultimately lose, in some sense, to specificity? 
probably. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have any? Do you have any other questions? Nope, that's it. <laughs>